All right, hello again. This is Jeff Scott of Blackhawk Technical College. I've been going over selected chapters of our book, Android Studios, Studio Development Essentials for the Spring 2016 semester. The class is 152-153 Mobile Web Development Android. And I'm now going to go over chapter 14, a fairly short chapter entitled Understanding Android Views, View Groups, and Layouts. As mentioned here, A user's interaction with an Android device is typically visual in nature. All of the interaction takes place through the user interface installed on the device, whether it be a built-in app, a third-party app installed by us, or whatever. So a key element, as it says, in developing these involves the design and creation of user interface. An Android device covers a lot of things. But a key part, as mentioning here, is to make sure that the layout resizes correctly when you're on different types of devices. All right, And also when you go from one orientation to another. In other, other words, portrait to landscape or vice versa. So every item in a user interface class is a subclass of the Android view class or Android view, dot view. Examples they give there, buttons, checkboxes, text views, etc. These are also referred to as widgets or components. Typically, they're referred to as widgets. Really what you have is the view is composed of other views. So you've got your main view and everything inside of it are child or container views. All right. How about layout managers? Well, we've looked at some of these already, and these are shown on the bottom of page 118 and the top of page 119 in your book. You've got a linear way out, layout, rather, which, as it says, positions child views in a single row or column depending on the orientation. You can also set a weight value to, to specify how much layout space the child should occupy relative to other children. You can have a table layout to arrange child views in a grid format of rows and columns. A frame layout to allocate an area of the screen typically for the purposes of displaying a, a single view. A relative layout, which is the default, and as the author mentions, probably the most powerful and flexible of the layout managers. It allows child views to be positioned relative both to each other and to the containing view layout through the specification of alignments and margins. There is absolute layout, which allows child views to be positioned at specific XY coordinate locations, although this is discouraged. All right, because as it says, it lacks the flexibility to respond to changes in screen size and screen orientation. Finally, there is the grid layout. And as mentioned here, the grid layout, it's relatively new, introduced in Android 4.0. It's divided by invisible lines that form a grid containing rows and columns of cells. All right. So the view hierarchy, bottom of page 119, and on to page 120 in your text. As it says, each view in a user interface represents some kind of a rectangular area display. The view is responsible for what's drawn in there and for responding to events that happen. So if you look in here in this example, what do we have? We've got two buttons and four checkboxes. So that view, all right, could have a number of other layout views that control how different things are positioned. So they're showing it here, but if we look on the next page, notice that we might have these two buttons inside of a linear layout. The whole thing might be in a relative layout. All right, We might have the first two checkboxes in one table row, and the next two checkboxes in another table row, as are shown right here. So what we're getting is we're literally getting a view hierarchy. 
and you can see how it's set up there. So user interfaces, as mentioned here, are constructed in the form of a view hierarchy with the root view on top. The hierarchy gives the clearest overview of the relationship between the various views that make up the interface. When a user interface is displayed to the user, the Android runtime walks the view hierarchy starting at the root and working its way down the tree as it renders each view. So the idea, and this is a very, very short paragraph, or chapter rather, the next few chapters will now focus on the steps involved in creating user interfaces for Android activities. There are three different approaches that you can use to do this. That is the Android Studio Designer Tool, Handwriting XML Layout Resource Files, or Writing Java Code. And I believe at least that will be pretty much the subject of the next three chapters of the book, chapters 15, 16, and 17. So, in summary, each element within a user interface screen is a view that is ultimately, ultimately subclassed from android.view.view. Each view represents a rectangular area of the display and is responsible for both what appears in that rectangle and how events that take place within its boundaries are handled. The Android SDK includes a range of pre-built built views that can be used to create a user interface. And again, as we'll find in the next chapter, in chapter 15, we will talk about how to create these using the user design tool. Then we'll jump into chapter 16, where we'll learn how to create these using the Android Studio Designer tool. And then finally in this chapter 17, where we'll learn how to do this using actual Java code. So that's the next three chapters that are coming up.